Hi everyone. Are you preparing for your coding interviews or are you someone who's trying to learn data structures and algorithm to become a better software engineer? If yes, then you definitely know there are many many data structures and algorithms. It makes us anxious to understand exactly which ones to be studying or is it really required that we know all those DSA algorithms? And the answer is no, not at all. That's a good news, right? In today's video, we are going to talk about 10 important concepts in DSA both data structures and algorithms which every person who wants to become a better software engineer or who wants to crack these coding companies should know about Hi my name is Dapali and on this channel we talk about software engineering so if you haven't subscribed please consider subscribing let's begin Make sure to watch this video till the very end because I'm going to give you a bonus tip which is going to help you to become a better software engineer and thus crack your coding interviews let's talk about the first concept which you should know of and that is arrays arrays is a simplest data structure which stores your data in a continuous fashion that means if you want to store say 10 integers this integers will be stored one after the other similar to like a train bogey right so if you have to understand what arrays is the simplest example is of that of a table you know right we have tables in maths there is rows and columns right so when you have simply one row that can be thought of like a one dimensional array if you have to consider a entire table that can be considered as a as a two dimensional arrays in coding okay as you can see here we have an array all right the name of the array is a i have been basically storing what integer data because array is usually takes fixed amount of size when you are declaring your array you always need to mention what is the size of your data which should be storing in this data structure the second on the list is linked list linked list is a data structure where the data can be accessed sequentially suppose you are starting off and you want to store say let's say 10 data at a time right but might be in future the size of this data can increase or decrease might be right now you want to store 10 elements but might be in future you, the size can increase to 15 or might reduce to 5 but at the same time you also want to access your data in a sequential manner that means i want to first access my first element then the second element which i have inserted third and so on then the data structure which is used is the linked list data structure right the practical scenario where linked list is used is the playlist I think everybody has you know uh, know about Spotify right we have playlist on Spotify the data structure which actually implements the playlist is actually a linked list data structure so in linked list data structure there are three kinds of linked list which are possible one is a single linked list meaning you only have one pointer or one reference in that node of a linked list when you talk about double linked list now you can traverse in both the direction from your current node you can go to the next node or you can also visit the previous node the word double is actually standing for two references which are present inside the list of the node of the linked list the third and the final linked list which we have is called as a circular linked list in this a uh, particular type as the name suggests the last node of your linked list is actually pointing to the first node of your uh, of the linked list that is called as a circular linked list circular linked list can be constructed both with a single linked list and also with a double linked list if you are the one who is actually preparing for interviews it's especially important that you cover this topic make sure that you are able to design a single linked list and are also able to reverse a linked list The next we have on list is stacks and queues. Now these two data structures are you know been clubbed together because they are very similar to each other. These data structures are widely used. When it comes to stack, you can use stacks is actually used in programming languages to handle the function calls or also to handle the recursive function calls. Queue is basically used when you want to do resource utilization in operating system. These are one of the very few applications of these data structures. Now let's talk about what these are. stack can be thought of as basically stack or a pile of books when we have pile of books the whichever book which we you know insert or you know place at the last that book will be the one to be removed first right so that is basically you are basically given a container where the addition and the insertion of data can only happen from one end that is the stack data structure the the data removal or the data insertion strategy the which stack follows is basically last in and first out that means whatever data was lastly inserted into the stack will be the data which will be removed 
first. The addition of data into the stack is called as the push operation and the removal of data from stack is called as the pop operation. Let's talk about queue. Queue data structure is very similar to the queue which we actually form on our bus lines or basically on a bank, right? In, in the, when the queue, what happens, whoever person has entered first in the queue will be the person to enter into the bus or will be the person to be, you know, get serviced by the bank employee first, right? That means whoever enters first will be the first person to leave the queue. So this particular data structure follows first in, first out policy. Here, Entry of the data happens from one end and removal of the data happens from the opposite end as you can see. Addition of data in a queue is called as a NQ operation and deletion of data from the queue is called as a DQ operation. Make sure that you are able to uh, apply these data structures in the relevant coding questions. The next on the list is map. This is the very crucial data structure which is called as hash map when we use in Java. So hash map is basically can be thought of as a key value pair. So whenever you want to store data in the form of a pair, that means when there is some association between the data. For example, if I want to store a table which basically has color code on one side and the name of the color which is associated with that code, I can use or utilize this map or a hash map data structure to store it, right? So your data is always stored in a key value fashion. There are many applications of hash map. One of them is caches, right? We all have no, have know about caching. So in caching, hash map is used. You can also use hash map in the case of indexing in either indexing your web pages or also indexing in terms to databases. So this is something which you should know of. Let's talk about trees. Trees is a very important data structure which has many practical applications like in networking and in database management systems where indexes are being, you know, uh, implemented using binary search trees. So in trees, the most important topic is binary trees. Nothing but those are nothing but trees which have only at most two children. That is every node can have at the most two children. If you want to know more about binary trees or binary search trees, I've already created a video on the same. You can do check that out. Make sure before you go for the interviews in this topic, you are able to traverse trees by all the different breadth first search and depth first search methods. And along with that, you're able to solve certain questions on binary search trees and a bunch of another problem solving uh, questions on trees. Now let's start talking about the algorithms. The first algorithm which I have for you is Moth Sort. Moth Sort is an application of divide and conquer strategy. If you do not know what divide and conquer is, then do check out my video where I have explained in detail what divide and conquer strategy means. Let's come back to this. So Moth Sort is a sorting algorithm in which is primarily used to sort your non-primitive data types like linked list. It's also used in very important sorting algorithms like external sort. External sort is actually a modification of moth sort, which is used to sort your data in real life or in real projects, right? As you can see, I have some data here, 38, 27, 43, 9, and 82, which I want to sort using moth sort. What moth sort is going to do is it was going to divide my entire array into two parts, into two sub problems. So I have basically my first step the data is divided into one part, which is 38, 27, 43, and the second part is 9 and 82. I'm going to keep on dividing my array until I get in one sub problem, the, the size of that sub problem would be one. As you can see in step number three, I get 38 as one sub problem and 27 as another sub problem. As you know, when you have a date or have an array or have a sub problem, which is size of one, that data or that sub array is already sorted. So now we are going to start the process of combining or what we call it as conquering in divide and conquer strategy. That means now I have two sorted sub arrays, like basically 38 and 27, and I'm going to combine the sorted sub array to form a big sub array, which is completely sorted. So after I combine 38 and 27, I'm going to get 27 and 38, which is a sorted sub array. So I continue doing this, basically combining the solutions of my sorted sub problems to finally get an entire array, which is sorted. So this is a strategy of mod sort, which uses divide and conquer. But there is one catch. Mod sort actually uses an additional space, okay? But if you want an algorithm, all right, which does not use this additional space, but needs to be, you need this sorting algorithm for practical applications, then you can use something called as quick sort. Quick sort is another divide and conquer strategy, but the only drawback of quick sort is it is not a stable sorting algorithm. 
again if you do not know what a stability means when it comes to sorting algorithm i have an entire video which talks about it in my sorting playlist do check it out so quick sort and merge sort these are two important sorting algorithms which are used in industry merge sort is used to sort your non primitive types like linked list and quick sort is used if you have large data sets which needs to be sorted and you do not have need you do not have the liberty of using extra space that's where quick sort comes into play now let's talk about the searching algorithms the first on the list is binary search binary search is the most efficient searching algorithm provided that the data which you have is sorted so now here i have 3 8 10 and 12 which is a sorted order and i want to find out a target value 10 to do that the binary search is going very similar to divide and conquer is going to divide your entire array into two parts now we have 3 and 8 as first part and 10 and 12 as the second part now we simply ask a question where is the possibility of finding 10 obviously the possibility of finding 10 is in the second half between 10 and 12 now in 10 and 12 we are again going to divide this sub row this particular sub array into two parts we get 10 and 12 now we have already found our target value at 10 so basically i just required two steps and i was able to find my target value this is the most efficient you know searching algorithm which you should know of the second most important searching algorithms are going to be breadth first search and depth first search traverses let's understand this by taking other traverses on the tree we have just spoken about tree right so you have a binary tree let's try to perform a breadth first search traversal on this binary tree So the data you're going to land up with is twelve, then fourteen and fifteen, and ten and three. I've basically done a breadth first search, a breadth first search traversal on the tree. The second traversal which you can do is something called as depth first search traversal. Depth first search traversal, as the name suggests, is going to go and you know search in one depth until and until no more data is left in that particular direction. For example, if you start searching from twelve, it's going to go from twelve to fourteen, from fourteen to ten. After ten, there is no more data left, so it's going to backtrack and then go to you know three and then fifteen. That is your depth first search traversal. Usually, BFS uses Q data structure for implementation, and DFS, that is your depth first search traversal, uses stack data structure. It's important that you are able to solve and apply these traversals both on binary trees and also on matrices. Let's talk about recursion. Recursion is a technique by which you can solve a lot of coding questions. as you can see here recursion i have written a recursive uh, function for finding out the nth fibonacci series as you can see i have basically done a call to the function itself that exactly is what recursion is recursion is nothing but you are calling the function again inside the body of the function now in recursion there are two things one is the call to itself and second is the stopping condition or it has a very good name which is called as base conditions base condition can be thought of like a stopping condition or stopping criteria which we use for a for loop or while loop whenever you keep on you know calling the function itself you are going to basically reach a point where now you cannot call the function again rather you simply give the value for that particular input that is what base condition is for example for this fibonacci uh, series if i am trying to find out my sixth fibonacci number right now inside the function i am going to make a call to finding the fibonacci series uh, fibonacci of 5 and fibonacci of 4 you keep on doing this when you reach a value where the n value is equal to 1 you're simply that is where the base condition is being reached and you're going to simply return a value that is your base condition it's very important for you all to understand what recursion is and do now uh, practice a lot of questions around recursion because it's not very intuitive at first but more and more you practice the more easier it will be for you to write a recursive solution the next on list is memoization memoization again is a technique which is basically more of an optimization technique whenever you are solving any problem right we let's say we have computed certain problem which is like more of an intermediate step it is quite possible that when you are solving a huge problem or a complex problem might be you require to you know uh, recalculate a certain intermediate solution again and again if you are going to you know re uh, calculate the intermediate solution again and again it's basically wasting the computer resources right so instead of that what memoization suggests is you can basically build a cache very similar to cache or basically a storage place where let's say you have calculated a solution to an intermediate step 
Now you can simply store this solution in a cache or something like a table, right? Now next time when you encounter the same problem, the same intermediate step, you can simply now instead of calculating again, you can simply, you know, use the value which you have previously calculated from this cache. That is the entire funda of memoization. Now, if you now practice recursion and if you understand how to use memoization, the most important topic, which is dynamic programming, will dynamic programming will be mostly a cakewalk for you. Dynamic programming is literally all about being able to use recursion and then being able to, you know, optimize it by using memoization. So do make sure that you are very comfortable with recursion and memoization. Time for the bonus tip. So as you all know that we are basically doing this coding just to solve the real world problems, right? And that's why we're using DAC so that we can write a very good solution to the real world problem. But what if, you know, we have different algorithms to solve the same problem? How do we decide which algorithm is better than the, the other one? To basically able to quantify the performance, okay, of an algorithm, we basically use two factors. One is the amount of time the algorithm takes and the second, is, the second one is what is the space requirement for that algorithm. Now, you must say that is very easy. Why not I can simply use bytes for space and why not I can come up with time in terms of milliseconds or nanoseconds for the algorithm. But you need to understand that we have different machines and every machines have different configurations and there's so many other factors which are going to affect the space and the time factor. So we need to come up with certain, you know, way which is like, you know, universal and you know we, by that we be able to quantify the performance of an algorithm computer scientists have come up with a concept which is basically called as asymptotic notations so now you can you know measure the performance of an algorithm for the time factor we use asymptotic notations and define something called as time complexity which tells us how much time would an algorithm take as a function of the input and second is the space complexity, which basically gives us an idea of how much space will this algorithm require in terms of, again, as a function of the input. So these two things you should always be able to identify for the algorithm you are going to write. Because in the coding interviews, once you have finished solving the question, the interviewer will expect you to tell them the time and the space complexity. If in case you have solved the question correctly, but you are unable to give the correct time and space complexity, then it can be a red signal and you might lose on your job. So please make sure that you understand the time and space complexity analysis. Take care. Bye.